iPhone or Nexus phone or the next better guitar or the bigger house and, and all those material things and then a reality our focus should be in the, the material things that we want should be in heaven you know? Amen. because all of this is going to perish and and we should you know live one day at a time and and think about the home that we're going to have in heaven in reality not here well that's that's my thought okay Thank you, Brother Eric. That song definitely expresses the longing of all of us here. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 32. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. 
When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto you, and my iniquity have I hid not. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. We're thrilled to have our sister Tallulah here with us. And I turn it over to her. Thank you, and I'm thrilled to be here. You know, it is um, such a blessing to be able to read along uh, with the Bible while our brother reads it to us. And I notice so many of you turning in your Bibles. And I'd like to ask you to turn again to Leviticus 16. And I'm going to read this whole chapter. Now, it's a long chapter, but there's a point in my reading it. And I'll tell you the point ahead of time. I want you to notice just how much trouble it is to get sins forgiven. You know, it said in Psalm 32, you have forgiven my sin, Lord. And that Psalm 32 was written before the time of Christ. So, you know, it was written during this time in Leviticus that it's talking about here in Leviticus 16. This is how much trouble they had to go to back then to get their sins forgiven and when we get through reading this chapter you're going to say hallelujah uh, for our savior for sure after aaron's two sons died before the lord the lord said to moses warn your brother aaron not to enter into the holy place behind the veil where the ark and the place of mercy are just whenever he chooses the penalty for intrusion is death for I myself am present in the cloud above the place of mercy. So he's saying, I'm in there. You know, don't just come in there for some small minor reason because that's my place where I am. Here are the conditions for his entering there. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He must bathe himself and put on the sacred linen coat, shorts, belts, and turbans. The people of Israel shall then bring two male goats for their sin offering and a ram for their burnt offering. First, he shall present to the Lord the young bull as a sin offering for himself, making atonement for himself and his family. Then he shall bring the two goats before the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle and cast lots to determine which is the Lord's and which is to be sent away. The goat allotted to the Lord shall then be sacrificed by Aaron as a sin offering. The other goat shall be kept alive and placed before the Lord. The rite of atonement shall be performed over it, and it shall then be sent out into the desert as a scapegoat. What's the rite of atonement? It's after we are forgiven, we are restored to our relationship with the Lord. That's what atonement is. And so back in these days, it only happened one day a year. One day a year. They had all their sins forgiven and they were atoned. They were reconciled. They were reunited with the Lord. Verse 11. After Aaron has sacrificed the young bull as a sin offering for himself and his family, he shall take a censer full of live coals from the altar of the Lord, fill his hands with sweet incense beaten into fine powder, and bring it inside the veil. There before the Lord he shall put the incense upon the coals, so that a cloud of incense will cover the mercy place above the ark, containing the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Thus he will not die. And he shall bring some of the blood of the young bull and sprinkle it with his finger upon the east side of the mercy place and then seven times in front of it. Then he must go out and sacrifice the people's sin offering goat and bring its blood within the veil and sprinkle it upon the place of mercy and in front of it, just as he did with the blood of the young bull. This is a lot of blood. This is a lot of blood, isn't it? Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because it is defiled by the sins of the people of Israel and for the tabernacle located right among them and surrounded by their defilement. 
Not another soul shall be inside the tabernacle when Aaron enters to make atonement in the holy place. Not until after he comes out again and has made atonement for himself and his household and for all the people of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar before the Lord and make atonement for it. He must smear the blood of the young bull and the goat on the horns of the altar and sprinkle blood upon the altar seven times with his finger. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thus cleansing it from the sinfulness of Israel and making it holy. I mean, are you getting the picture? This was a lot of work, wasn't it? A lot of work, a lot of blood, a lot of shaking the finger, a lot of, this was a lot of stuff going on. When he has completed the rite of atonement for the holy place, the entire tabernacle and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and laying both hands upon its head, confess over it all the sins of the people of Israel. He shall lay all their sins upon the head of the goat and send it into the desert led by a man appointed for the task. So now there's another man involved. So the goat shall carry all the sins of the people into a land where no one lives, and the man shall let it loose in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall go into the tabernacle again and take off the linen garments he wore when he went behind the veil and leave them there in the tabernacle. Then he shall bathe in a sacred place, put on his clothes again, and go out and sacrifice his own burnt offering for the people, making atonement for himself and for them. He shall also burn upon the altar the fat for the sin offering. Has anybody ever read The Cat in the Hat? Yes. So in that book, written by Ted Geisel, Dr. Seuss, every time they tried to get rid of the red, they would smash it against here, smash it against there, and the red would go everywhere. It would fly everywhere. Then they'd have to clean up all that red. That's what this reminds me of. You know, everywhere the blood had touched, everywhere the man had been, everywhere the clothes had been worn, all of this then has to be cleansed. The man who took the goat out into the desert shall afterwards wash his clothes and bathe himself and then come back into the camp. And the young bull and the goat used for the sin offering, their blood was taken into the holy place by Aaron to make atonement, shall be carried outside the camp and burned, including the hides and all the internal organs. Afterward, the person doing the burning shall wash his clothes and bathe himself and then return to camp. So far we've had, I think, three separate people washing their clothes. This is a permanent law. You must do no work on the 25th day of September, but must spend the day in self-examination and humility. This applies whether you're born in the land or are a foreigner living among the people of Israel, for this is the day commemorating the atonement, cleansing you, in the Lord's eyes from all your sins. It's a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. You shall spend the day in quiet humility. This is a permanent law. This ceremony in later generations shall be performed by the anointed high priest, consecrated in place of his ancestor Aaron. He shall be the one to put on the holy linen garments and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. The tabernacle, the altar, the priests, and the people. This shall be an everlasting law for you to make atonement for the people of Israel once a year because of their sins. And Aaron followed all these instructions that the Lord gave to Moses. Wow. I'm glad I didn't have to remember all of that. I probably would have gotten mixed up and forgotten one little minor point and just wrecked the whole thing. What is forgiveness? An expungement of the record so that the sins are no longer even remembered. They no longer count against us. So how does it help me? How does it help you to be forgiven? Yes, that broken relationship between us and God is healed when we're forgiven, isn't it? It's healed, it's restored. Our, relation, our connection to 
to him is restored. Uh, Bill Bazin used to say atonement was at one moment. You know, we are at one again with the Lord. It takes away our guilt for our sins because we know we are forgiven, so we have no more guilt. So who is the only one that can forgive? Who? Who is the only one that can forgive? God is the only one. So if God is the only one who can forgive, why am I told several times, many times, in this wonderful book that I must forgive? Why must I forgive if God's the only one who can forgive? Wow. Well, that's the question we're going to look at today. Do you think you'll be intrigued to find out what the answer is? <laughs> Anxious. What are some of the opposites of forgiveness? What's one opposite? Forgiveness versus... Holding a grudge. What? Versus holding a grudge. Good. Blaming somebody else. Yeah. I can forgive them or I can blame them. Those are opposites. What else? What's another opposite of forgiveness? Condemnation. I can forgive you or I can condemn you. Exactly. What's another one? Worry. worry. I can forgive you or I can just sit on the edge of my bed and worry about it. Oh! Judgment. What did you say? Somebody said... Sue you. Sue, sue, you. <laughs> sue you can sue me. I can forgive you or I can take you to court and sue you. Um, I can forgive you or I can get revenge but we're told not to do that right we're told not to get revenge because revenge belongs to who Lord. the Lord and forgiveness also belongs to the Lord so in other words it's not our business to get in the, involved in that we're told not to judge other people so judging is the opposite of forgiven of being forgiven. So we are told specifically not to judge. We are told specifically to forgive. So it's pretty clear that those other jobs are God's and not ours. What did the Amish people do instead of forgiving? Sure. They shun somebody. That's another opposite, isn't it? Another thing that we can do instead of forgiving is to get bitter. You know, I've known old people who were so bitter over stuff that happened in their lives 40 years ago that they were still suffering about it. They were bitter over the fact that somebody else did something to them. Well, being bitter for 40 years, did that hurt the other person who did it? No, who did it hurt? It hurt the bitter one, didn't it? Hurt them. Another opposite of forgiveness is anger. I can forgive you or I can just stay mad at you. That's another opposite. So let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs 17, verse 9. And I've got it written down here, so I'll just read it to you. It says, love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. So that's a, a proverb. Love forgets mistakes. So that means I, if I forget your mistakes, I have what? I have forgiven you. Because God puts those together. He says forgive and, and forget about it. And He does that. When He forgives, He forgets about it. He doesn't remember our sins any longer. And He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, which is another thing only He can do. So how many of us here in this room are eligible for God's forgiveness? Wait, I'm only seeing about eight or nine hands. How many of us here are eligible for God's forgiveness? Turn around and point to all the people who are eligible that don't have their hands up. Right? You and you, you're all eligible. All of us. We're all eligible, aren't we? Because Jesus said he came to forgive, you know, more than 56% of the people. Right? 
That's not what he said. What did he say? All. All. And to cleanse all from unrighteousness. Um, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Jonah. And Jonah's one of those little prophet books. It's pretty close after Ezekiel. And let's look at Jonah verses one, Jonah chapter one, verses one through three. Who will read that for us, please? Jonah chapter one, verses one through three. Who will read that for us, please? Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amida, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down with Joppa, and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah was actually hiding from the Lord. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why did he not want to go to Nineveh? Let me phrase this another way. What was Jonah mad about? He was angry. What was he angry about? He knew that God would what? He knew if he went to Nineveh and told them what the Lord said and they responded beautifully and did as the Lord commanded, Jonah knew that God would what? Forgive them. And Jonah didn't want the Ninevites forgiven. He didn't like them. He thought they were mean. Well, they were mean. He didn't want God to forgive him. He wanted God to stay mad at him and punish him. So Jonah was angry and bitter at God. But Jesus is our model, and Jesus was not angry and bitter. He was merciful. Jesus was always merciful. How many people did he forgive in his lifetime? Think of some critical, important people that he forgave. The soldiers who were nailing him to the cross, the soldiers who were putting a crown of thorns on his head, the soldiers who were whipping him and scourging him and causing him tremendous, tremendous pain. He, say, Pontius Pilate. He forgave the thief on the cross. Who? Yes? Yes? So Jesus is our model. How many people are we supposed to forgive? Everyone. And how many times are we supposed to forgive them? <laughs> 70 times 7, which makes 490 times. So I need to get one of those record-keeping books because I'll have to have a page for everybody I know. I'll have to have a page for David and a page for Christina, a page for Caitlin and a page for Jeff. I'll have to have a page for everybody and keep track of how many times I've forgiven them so that uh, when it's 490 times I can stop, right? No, that's not it? Have I got it wrong? Okay, so what does it mean when we say we forgive somebody 490 times. Say again, please. Always. We forgive them always. And we forgive them as many times as it takes. Until they die or we die or, you know, our time of forgiveness with one another is over with. Yeah, we're told to forgive them always. That's what 70 times 7 means. It doesn't mean go buy a huge ledger book so you can keep track of all this stuff. That would be back like Leviticus 16. You know, keeping records of all those clothes that had been washed off and burned and all of that stuff. How do we know that God forgives us all the time? How do we know that? Yeah. 
Yes? He wouldn't have done that, would he? That's too big a, a thing to do. And, what? He, whenever we ask Him, He forgives us. Okay, so we have this as a promise. He says to us, you know, if you will confess and repent your sins, John, uh, 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, if you, I will be faithful and just to forgive how many of your sins? All your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He gives us that promise. So we know if we ask God to forgive us, He will. It's as simple as that. He says, he says so right here in this holy book. Let's look at Micah. Micah's just a few pages past Jonah. Let's look at Micah uh, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Who will read that for us, please? Amen. Amen. I love that. It says, you cannot stay angry with your people because you love to be merciful. God is what? God is love. And love is mercy. And mercy is forgiveness. And forgiveness is love. And it's all a circle wrapped up together. That's what God loves to do. He loves us and He loves to forgive us and He loves to be merciful to us. And he loves for us to do what? Say what? To do the same. To do the same to other people. That's right. So sometimes I draw this as a diagram. You can think of this big source up here. It's God. He's the source of all mercy, the source of all love, the source of all forgiveness. And he means for it to flow down to this middle thing, which is what? It's us. So we are a conduit through which can flow His great love, mercy, and forgiveness to whom? To other people. And sometimes we're the only route He has. We're the only conduit He has. What if you've got somebody down here in this third circle of my diagram who won't ask the Lord to forgive? You know, I've known people like that. They were just so stubborn, they would never ask the Lord to forgive them. In a way, my husband is like that. You know? He's just tough and growly, gristly and grumpy, and he's not going to ask God for anything. That's not the way he is. So, let's look at what God says about that in his... Because he does. He does say something about that. So what about the ones who won't ask God for forgiveness? Let's look at Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah is just a little bit after Micah. Zechariah chapter 3. And this is a, a vision of Joshua and the accuser and the forgiver. So it's like a, a morals play. You have a character, Joshua, and you have the accuser, who is who? Satan. And you have the forgiver, who is who? Jesus, God. Exactly. So if we look at, it says, The angel showed me in my vision, Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was there too, at the angel's right hand, accusing Joshua of many things. And the Lord said to Satan, I reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, I the Lord, for I have decided to be merciful. I rebuke you. I have decreed mercy to Joshua and his nation. They are like a burning stick pulled out of the fire. 
So God says, Satan, I reject your accusations. I have decided to be merciful. Why? Because that's the way the Lord is. He's a merciful God. We remember in that text we read, he loves to be merciful. He loves to forgive us. Someone read for us, please, Matthew 6, verse 12, and then verses 14 through 15. Matthew 6, verse 12, and then verse 14 and 15. You can read 13 if you want to, or you can skip over. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. For if you forgive man their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. All right. Thank you. You did a very nice job of reading that, and I'm going to read it again, not because she didn't do a good job, but because I have a different translation just to hear it in different words. And some of you may have a different translation you'd like to share with us. Um, this is in the uh, bottom of the Lord's Prayer. It says, Forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. So that's what we're told to pray to the Father. We're told to pray to Him to please forgive us. And then jump down to 14 and 15. Your Heavenly Father will forgive you if you forgive those who sin against you. But if you refuse to forgive them, what? He will not forgive you. Whoa, those stakes are pretty high. You know, we're told to forgive others in order that He may be able to forgive us. Right? So the stakes are pretty high on there. Is, is being unforgiving a sin? It is. If we say it's a sin, then it must break one of the Ten Commandments. Let's look at Exodus 20 and see which one it breaks. Exodus 20, back at the front of the Bible. All right, so there we go. First commandment is what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And uh, Zach talked about that this morning in Sabbath school. To have another god is can be anything, right? It can be drinking. It can be cursing. It can be having a lot of money. It can be... Anything, you know, if we choose that over God, then that's having another God before him. So if we don't forgive, do we have another God before him? What is it? Our pride. Our pride. That's right. Our pride, uh, maybe even our selfishness. You know, we want to be right. You know, we don't want to... Like Jonah, you know, running for the Lord. We don't want the Lord to be merciful to this person, so we're unforgiving ourselves. Um, so it breaks the first commandment. Does it break any others? What? Uh, yeah, if you break one, you've broken them all, haven't you? That's exactly right. Uh, someone read Matthew 26, verse 28 to us. Matthew 26, verse 28. It just appears back there. Like, is this a miracle? or? <laughs> I've never seen such a fancy thing. This is great. All right, Matthew 26, verse 28. Who will read that for us, please? Okay, so my translation says it's poured out to forgive the sins of the multitudes. Same thing, just a different translation. So, how many people has Jesus already 
provided forgiveness for? All of us. Has he already provided forgiveness for that person that I won't forgive? Yes, he's already provided forgiveness for them. So can I withhold forgiveness from that person? No, I can't withhold God's forgiveness from them because Jesus has already provided. And God already said, you know, he wants everybody to be forgiven. So look at uh, Luke 23, verse 34. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, isn't it yours? Somebody read that to or just tell it want to tell us what it says. What does it say? Thirty four. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Twenty three verse thirty four. And so, um, and let's look at John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, and verses 14 and 17. Who won't read that to us, please? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, let me read you my translation. You can tell I love this translation, can't you? And Christ became a human being and lived here on earth among us and was full of loving forgiveness and truth. Because that's what love is. It's forgiveness and truth. Go ahead to 17. Amen. And mine says, uh, the law with its rigid demand and merciless justice uh, were from Moses while Jesus Christ brought us loving forgiveness. So that's what we have from our Savior. You know, he brought the rest of that, which was always part of God the Father. But, you know, it had gotten lost over the years of those rigid demands. Look at John 20. Verses 21 and 23. Now this is a very important one. And we may have to look at it in several translations. John 20. And remember the question I raised was. If God is the one who. And the only one who can forgive. Why are we asked to forgive others? And so read that for us please. John 20 verses 21 through 23. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, the rest of it. Okay. three, If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Okay, read that one more time. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Wow. So it tells me if I forgive anyone's sins, it's like intercessory prayer. It's like I can forgive someone so that God will forgive them. It says it right there. It says if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Because I am interceding in a way with the Lord for them. And it says if I don't forgive them, they're unforgiven. So here's this person. Let's say for the sake of the example, my dear husband who I love so much. And he's too uh, stubborn to ask the Lord for forgiveness. And then I don't forgive him either. How's the Lord for, going to forgive him if he doesn't ask and I don't intercede? So 
You know, not forgiving somebody has two very important results. Number one, it bottlenecks the Lord's forgiveness of us. And number two, if that other person isn't in a right relationship with God, it can bottleneck his forgiveness of them. Because he needs something, you know, to open up that forgiveness that he has already provided. He needs us to accept the gift that he has given us. Well, what if my husband won't accept the gift? But it says right here, read it again for me. Num verse number 23. If you... Unforgiven, that's right. My translation says unforgiven. So our forgiveness of other people, the stakes just went up, didn't they? The stakes just went up. It's even more important. It's not just a minor thing. Not just, I'm sorry, oh, that's all right, don't worry. It's not just like that. It's an important thing to do, to forgive someone. It's an important thing. The impact on us is important. The impact on them is important. It's important to do. So what happens to us when we forgive someone? What happens to your faith in God when you forgive someone? <laughs> it's what? Yeah, it builds. It grows bigger, you know. You become free. You become liberated. You know, it's like that big soggy albatross just lifted up from your shoulders, you know, when you quit carrying that thing around. And we are able to receive more of what? What? God's grace. More of the Holy Spirit. We're able to take more in. It creates the pipeline gets bigger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we forgive somebody else, can you see how in a way we are participating in a partnership with God. We are doing the Lord's work, as people are fond of saying. Not that we could take it away from Him. Not that He needs us to do His work. He's fine without us. But isn't it a joy? Isn't it an honor? Isn't it a blessing and a treasure and a pleasure to participate with Him in doing His loving work of forgiveness and mercy. What a pleasure to be able to do that. So, oh, what a blessing it is for us. What is it like for them when we forgive them? How does it feel to you when you get forgiven? A relief, isn't it? It is. It is to me too. You know, when my husband forgives me as he always does, bless his dear heart. That's how I know he's not really an atheist. Um, when he gives, forgives me for something, it's like, ah, oh, he still loves me anyway. You know, even though I was mean or snappy or whatever indiscretion I committed, but he still loves me anyway. And um, let's go back to Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. That was our text, and, you know, uh, it was... It was read very, very well, um, but I just want to read it in this translation. Psalm, pretty much in the middle of the Bible, Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys when sins are covered over. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. Can we say amen? amen? There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was. But my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night your hand was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you. And I stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord. And you forgave me. Hallelujah. 
and all my guilt is gone. I love that. I love that verse. Let's see what Paul had to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through the end. Who would read that one for us, please? Second Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through the end. In all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Amen. And hath given to us the mission to witness that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses unto them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Amen. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead received by you reconciled, reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Amen. So that's how Christ brought us back to God, was through forgiveness of our sins. And God has given us the privilege of urging everyone to come into his favor and be reconciled. That's our pleasure. That's our duty. That's what he asks us to do in the Great Commission. Go forth. Go forth and tell everybody. Tell everybody what a loving, merciful, forgiving father we have who wants to be reconciled unto each and every one of us. Be reconciled to God. Let's look at Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. Who's got that one ready to read? Twelve, uh, chapter three, Colossians three, verses twelve and thirteen. Amen. So remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Be gentle, ready to forgive, never hold grudges. Don't worry about making a good impression. Be ready to suffer quietly and patiently if need be and forgive others. Be willing to suffer. You know, if someone has hurt you, it's better to forgive them. It's better. Even It doesn't take away your suffering, but... It does something more important to you. It reconciles you with God. The um, last one of these texts from Paul I wanted to look at was Hebrews 12, verse 15. Who will read that one? Hebrews 12, verse 15. Defiled. Thank you. So what it's saying is guard against bitterness. You know, that's one way we can help keep ourselves from getting bitter is just to forgive. You know, then we can feel that big soggy albatross lifting up off our shoulders. You know, hallelujah. God be praised indeed. So it's no longer a bur burden to us. All right. And um, James 3... The first paragraph. I'll just read it. 
James chapter 3, the first paragraph. Dear brothers, don't be too eager to tell others their faults, for we all make many mistakes. Anybody else? Am I the only one? Oh, you do? Good for you. Um, and when we teachers of religion who should know better do wrong, our punishment will be greater than it would be for others. If anyone can control his tongue, it proves that he has perfect control over himself in every other way. Um, so, you know, let me, uh, I want to go to our song, which is going to be our closing hymn. And I want to just read the, for it's number, page number 299. Turn with me if you would. And I'm just going to read you the first, I'm going to read, read it to you, you know, because... Forgive our sins as we forgive you taught us, Lord, to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. We don't have the capacity for, to forgive without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a godly thing to do. And the only way we can do it is for the Holy Spirit to give us that, that gift. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart? that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart. In blazing light, your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew. How trifling others' debts to us. How great our debt to you. Lord, cleanse the depths within our souls and bid us and bid resentment cease. Then by your mercy reconciled, our lives will spread your peace. That's my whole sermon right there, isn't it? We could have just sung that song. <laughs> um, so let's go back to the title of my sermon before we sing this song. And the title of the sermon was The Alternative to Forgiveness. So I would just ask you, what is the alternative? Misery is the alternative. I like that. So for those of us who are Christians who profess to love the Lord, He says He wants us to have the fullness of His joy. He doesn't want us to be miserable. So how can we have the fullness of His joy? Forgiving other people, that's right. And so then in that case, I'll ask again, what's the alternative to forgiveness? There's not one, is there? I mean, that's just it. We need to forgive. Pure and simple. All right, let's um, sing number hymn number 299. And uh, are you going to play it through one time? Because I've heard a rumor that this is an unfamiliar hymn. It's easy, though. It's easy. It's waltz time. Don't dance, though.
Father, please empower us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we may be able to go forth and forgive the ones who have hurt us. Lord, we know it is your will that we be able to suffer patiently and to accept the forgiveness from you and let us let ourselves be a conduit through which your blessed forgiveness can pass along to others. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.